for a <coughs> USB 350 Board of Education meeting to order. Welcome to all the visitors. And Cheryl, camera, please. Principals, welcome. Or changes to the agenda? Yeah, I have two uh, curriculum leadership institute uh, contract and uh, budget republication. You can add those two items under section C. Mr. President, I'm going to the thing that I'm amended. Second. Move and second to approve the agenda as uh, presented here. Any discussion? All in favor, right hand. Those same signs. Six zero. Uh, the consent agenda items are the minutes of the January, which is on your you call it desktop or on your iPad. Whatever you want. It's in your electronic figure. Uh, <laughs> your your green sheet. Uh, it's it's there in front of you. Bills. Budget report, activity fund reports. You'll note in the budget report we did get a, a large tax check this month. So. Uh, cash balances are a lot better now. Um, activity fund, you'll notice on the uh, athletics, it's running in a negative. That's a that's our district account. That it's just money in, money out for for the most part, for pay for officials, pay meet fees, uh, click the gate, and those things. We end up paying more out for officials and the cost of our athletics than we pull in from the gate. That's what that says. We make that up with district funds, replenish that. That's not where we buy our equipment and uniforms and supplies for the most part. That's all I had of note on the consent agenda. I did entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Mr. President, I move the board accept the consent agenda as presented. Sorry. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda as presented. Any discussion? All in favor, right hand. Opposed, same sign. 6 0. First item of business, <coughs> curriculum courses report. Okay, I'm going to uh, use this time for maybe some questions, and if our principals have anything to add here, what I've included here in your packet, uh, I think it's just important that we all understand what the kids are doing during a typical day and what we're offering them. Um, so our scheduled class time, um, Andrea, you want to speak to that for the elementary? Um, sure, uh, and you can see the information up there, and I believe it's also in your packet. Um, of course, in kindergarten through fourth grade, uh, day to day, we're going to have variance um, as far as core classes, how much time we spend with this class or that. PE, music, those don't vary day to day. The kids go to that every day. Um, first through fourth, they're getting art once a week. Um, Reading, our goal is 90 minutes a day. Um, K through 4 is getting 30 minutes of MTSS time and reading a day, and that can count toward our 90 total minutes of reading per day. Um, math, our goal is 60 minutes per day, um, and that's usually split up in center time. Any of you that have been in an elementary classroom know what that means, what that looks like. Um, social studies, science, those are um, fit in those other times. Um, we have kids being pulled out for Title I. Um, an elementary classroom is a busy place, a hectic place. We've got kids in and out. Um, and again, that's why, in all honesty, it does vary day to day um, based on what kids need, um, what else we have going on. Fifth and sixth um, looks more like your traditional seven hour a day schedule. Um, they go to PE every day for 56 minutes. Um, they have music 
the and band combined now um, several days a week, not every day. Um, computer or typing is the same way. They have it a couple days a week, not every day. Um, art is once a week for one period of the day. Um, the one thing that looks a little bit different is um, rather than having reading and um, English class, we just call it English language arts, and we have those in big blocks of time now. So the what would have been reading and what would have been English are mushed together, and we have big blocks called uh, English language arts where we're, we're trying to hit the four areas, um, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. So sometimes the names change. Here's an example. I, did, I didn't include them all, but here's one from second grade just to give you an idea of what a day might look like. Again, they're all different. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the fifth and sixth grade schedule. Any questions on what our elementary kids are, are getting day to day? Are any of the teachers using computer in the math and the reading and language art, or is it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, so they're yeah, um, we have several programs that we use to support our core reading instruction. Um, we use Lexia, um, which helps support phonics and music awareness. Um, you know, even early um, uh, you know segmentation. So the kids are on the computer starting in kindergarten using Lexia. Um, and we also have a program called Reading Plus. Um, that helps with fluency and comprehension. Once we have all those phonics, phonemic awareness, segmentation things in place, and they're ready to read, um, we can have them on Reading Plus. Our youngest students on Reading Plus are in second grade right now. So there is a technology piece, again, supporting our core instruction in reading with those particular programs. Um, with anything in school, your core instruction, what they're getting from the teacher is the most important thing. Um, and we're using the technology to help support that with those programs. Um, I do have a couple teachers that are really excited about using um, the iPads during center time in particular. You know, group of five kids, six kids, getting them on there. Um, uh, one particular um, teacher is wanting to use them to help get more writing, you know, involved um, with some of the second grade. So, uh, and I think we'll see more and more of that as the teachers get more comfortable with it. Um, and as once they learn that, yeah, the kids are going to go with it and um, really enjoy it. So, so yeah, we do have kids on the computer using the computer from kindergarten. Would you see any benefits to having a computer lab starting at a younger age? or? Um, and we kind of have, we have one that has developed slowly um, in what we usually call the elementary science room. We now have 12 computers in there, and so we use that as, as a computer lab. Um, so again, when kids are on Flexio or Reading Plus, we have a place for them to go um, to do that. And then the classrooms are going to have between three and five computers in them, again, for kids to be taking their AR tests, doing this or that. Mm -hmm. In. I was just wondering about an instructional computer lab class or something instead of, you know, that's separate from connecting to the math and reading and all that. So if, yeah. if there was a need for it, starting. Because um, a lot of schools start at kindergarten on a, as a lab. Right. A, yeah, and you know, with, you know, when those kids get on the computers in kindergarten, you know, part of what the teachers are doing for instruction is how you turn it on, what do you think is happening, so they're getting those kinds of, not as a formal class, but they are getting some of that. Um, and there has been um, more talk, more of a push, more of a need to get um, keyboarding skills started mm -hmm. much earlier um, because we are expecting kids to be able to type for state assessments, you know, well, the smarter balance assessments that um, fourth grade is going to be piloting, I, I was told that, yeah, those fourth graders are going to be expected to type several sentence answers into that test. Um, and I, I don't want any of my kids to get held up with 
the typing part of getting an answer right, right if their brains are, are getting tangled up trying to get the information out onto a screen that is going to be a problem so um, we have been talking about how we're going to get that curriculum down lower um, okay. when are we going to find time in the day all those I know. great I was questions like that going, mm. uh -huh. yeah but. yeah because what do you yeah, yeah. The time. yeah. shift to get uh -huh. something done yeah. <clears throat> okay thank you you're welcome <clears throat> Any questions about elementary? The idea is that we're going to talk a little bit more, hopefully next month, have a better idea of how those schedules might look different. Uh, so if there are things that input from the board, uh, uh, let us know between now and, and then. Uh, junior high and high school um, is a little more straightforward. Uh, seventh and eighth grades, you can kind of see it there. The 50 minutes vary. Sometimes it's 51, 56, uh, and, but just to give you an idea, uh, Mr. Bergen, the, any yeah, the, share here? Yeah, the junior high. <clears throat> we do a rotation so the junior high students can get um, facts, PE, and art, and they go through music, band, and then they have the core subjects. You can see that and we're a seven period day, and they get those every day. <clears throat> Junior high, yeah, it's pretty, there's not a lot, um, pretty straightforward junior high. The schedule's on page 13, it might be tough to see up there, but that's the schedule, you know. So band music is required in yeah. junior high. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any alternatives in the works, or? We've discussed it. Um, the struggle is, where do they go, where do they do, uh, staffing-wise. Uh, is that fair to say, Mr. Bergen? Yeah, there, there is no. Past year we've had that, that, and the reason it was uh, it became mandatory is because of there were no not other. having a place to go. Yeah. Over the years, um, I think um, since I've been here, we're like we have six teachers less, staff members less than what we used to have when I first got here. So we've just kind of you know, done more with less, and just kind of worked and saved money doing that, and so. Because of that, because of other things, MTSS, that's taking people away from having an alternative. So, yeah. And we've discussed yeah, that very idea, sure. uh, at least for band. Um, band becomes a struggle because the kids are, have to have an instrument, pay money for that. And if it's not something you want to do, uh, then you know, you can take care of the stuff. And, Maybe the kids that are in there that want to be in there get less out of it. Uh, the same, I guess, could be said for music, uh, you know, vocal music or math for that matter. But uh, not all the kids want to be in math class either. Um, any input from the board on that junior high schedule on what we ought to look at? Or? It, would you say then that staff would be the issue? leading constraint it's to, to having an to alternative having an alternative yes that fair to say mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's would something i mean if if it's a constraint because of both funding and i guess where i'm going with this would, would it an alternative be feasible that might hire someone almost like just a contract to offer a specific program for whatever, a couple hours a day. I mean, if, could, could you find some, if you could find a person in retirement, say, that might be willing to if, teach a, a <coughs> class or two, would that be something that... If they're a certified <laughs> teacher, otherwise we can't count it as part of the school day. Like, you can offer a study hall and give kids credit for a study hall. That's part of the school day. But you can't have a non-certified, somebody that's not a certified teacher come in and do that. But you're qualified to teach study hall. I don't know what that has to do with it. But uh, those well, are the rules we play by. And then the other thought part of that is we've also talked about expanded opportunity with online mm -hmm. options, right? Is that the opposite of that? 
it, it could. The struggle with those kids is uh, what do we offer them and do they have the maturity level to handle that. Um, right now we're looking at the all online primarily for high school, but it could be, I mean, it could be an option, yes. I need more of a hands-on type of Yeah. An agricultural class would be. Mm -hmm. Well, I see a couple of things that I'm seeing this. One is technology is missing out of the middle school, um, as well as some type of hands-on. Either a shop class or an ag uh, education. Because mm -hmm. there's no nothing there that gives kids hands on. And I, I really think middle school is a really a, a good area. Is there any way that we can have like in the area of computer science teach one of those classes at uh, eighth grade level? Yeah, it's a thought. And again, it comes down to staffing and how we shuffle people. But, I've got it down to consider, yeah. Well, I know they, didn't they used to have like a four, I don't know, fax, PE? I thought there was a. We still do, we just have three instead of four. Fax, band, and PE. And then there was the other. Fax, art, and DE. Yeah, and what was it Mr. Kinnaman taught? Is it a shop? I remember they built oh, racing tech cars music, and tech yeah, music. some yeah. sort of... When Mr. Kinnaman left, we, we only had one person back there now. Mm -hmm. well, if, you, you know, if you had a class, like your eighth grade class, and you had my computer one semester, and at the same time you had a tech uh, woodshop class, and you just flip-flopped that, you know, half of them at a time, 15 kids in each class. Classes aren't any bigger than 30, are they? No, the biggest one, yeah, eighth grade, eighth grade, it's the biggest class, there's 33 in there. Electronics. Other? Might fit with a lot of the career ready type direction to your colleges or going. And then on the uh, high school schedule, you know, that's entirely dependent on graduation requirements and um, I included with the packet the course description handbook of all our high school classes there. I'm not going to go through it all here. But did anybody have any questions on the high school courses? Uh, suggestions for anything there? Are, the, are a lot of these uh, classes pretty well attended? The spec, you know, like photo imaging and things like that. Other several students. You used to give us a. Yeah, we we did that earlier chart. this year. We had we had a sheet this year. I gave you one earlier this year that had did numbers you? in them. Oh, mm -hmm. I missed yeah. it. I we guess. Include that here. Yeah, I, yeah, I wrote that. I just, I just wrote the number in a little in each slot. Yeah. Um, <coughs> some classes have a good number in them. Some don't. Elective classes. One that piqued my interest, I'd never heard, I hadn't, wasn't aware we offered, was the uh, R&D for manufacturing. And that's one of those that's changed and the, the name has kind of changed mm -hmm. with the new career pathway. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those courses in the business computers and the art and the, and the shop, industrial arts, they're not a lot different from what we've offered in the past, but they've had to change names. So. So it might have been previously known as the CAD class or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Is that safe to say? Uh, oh. Yeah, we yeah, had computer aided drafting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, feel free if you have questions, let me know um, down the road. We'll talk a little more next month about some of those plan changes and what, what we might see down the road. Principals, anything else? Yeah, feel free to. Come into the classrooms, teachers will be glad to have you. All right, now we're going to preliminary calendar.
here. I got a few pages there for you on 24, 25, and 26. Um, we just wanted to share with you the uh, kind of the outline of the calendar here. Mr. Bergen's been working on uh, matching this year's calendar up to what next year's configuration might be. Um, we met as administrators and we kind of wanted to narrow down our uh, what we thought we might need for professional development uh, within reason. At the elementary level, we could use a lot more than we get. Um, uh, but we, we're also working to have some of that collaboration time during the school day, uh, maybe with common planning time. With our professional development days, right now we're at seven and a half. I think we can back that off to four and a half. Um, you see that we have a day and a half at the beginning, a uh, day in September and a day in February, uh, and then a half a day at the end of the first quarter and at the end of the third quarter. We mix that in with a half a work day and half a professional development day. Um, but we really need more time than just that. And uh, looking at early dismissal time so we can have you know, a couple hours where we can meet with our teams, uh, trying to find, uh, you know, this year we're working on our evaluation committee, trying to find team time to meet to do things like that uh, with our district leadership team. If you try to meet at 7.30, you got to get teachers back by 7.55. There's not much time to get things done uh, in that amount of time. Otherwise, we have to get subs, uh, which costs more money. So what we're looking at is, just four days of early dismissal time. Uh, I wanted to get thoughts, any thoughts on that. I know there was some discussion last year about early dismissal or late start, uh, once every couple of weeks, something like that. I know the feeling was not positive for that. Uh, I think this would be better than taking a full day. Uh, How did work when parents feel about it? Dismissal like that. Uh, One fifteen in the afternoon. You know, yeah. Working parents, you got preschool or say first, second, third graders. Does that work into the schedule? I mean, you got to think about those. Sure. Things. Oh yeah, we do. And the, and the alternative there is, do we do to find the time? Do we dismiss at noon or do we take a full day? And we thought it'd be better to mix in a few days where we have a couple hours. And yeah, it's a hardship. It is. It's it's tough. And uh, we could find, you know, we applied for the uh, after school program grant. Uh, we did not get that, but we are reapplying uh, for that. So we may still have something like that. Uh, we could find activities to do, uh, staffing them with aids, something like that to you know, cover. Maybe we should be deliberate in trying to coordinate with the Rec Commission, which offers some after school mm -hmm. programs periodically anyway, maybe yeah. just be deliberate in planning with yeah. them that those are days that they offer that. Yeah, we could very easily do that. And what, what, what do you think the staff would feel like in 115 professional development? I, 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 I think it would be positive. Like you said, with, with our meeting times, we're trying to steal their morning time when they're trying to get ready uh, to go for the day. Or we're going to take off a day. Like this year, we have you know, full days mixed in, and sometimes we're, we're scrambling for things to do. Sometimes it feels like we're, we're filling in the time. Again, the elementary, they've got plenty to do. And if we can work some of that time in with the junior high and high school, some of that. <coughs> We feel like we're backfilling that time and finding things productive to do. Uh, I don't want to come across as we're wasting the time. We've got Common Core and our iPads and all those things are, are new. But. As long as they're scheduled when there's not an uh, athletic event that would cause part of the staff to not be there. Mm -hmm. It would be a Wednesday. I think it's really your only option to do it. How do you do that? Do you have shortened classes or do you just not go to the last two of the day? Okay, we could do either. And we haven't talked schedule there, but you know, elementary is, you know, they can adjust their schedule during the day. But 
you know, the easy thing is you just don't have the last two classes of the day. And you could uh, tell parents that's the only time they can have dental appointments and more than office appointments. <laughs> yeah. Go days. back to the four day week argument again. <laughs> it's school week. The dentist would uh, love us when they I'll send them all in one day, two days. Again, yeah, we're trying to strike that balance between taking a whole day off or taking a half a day. Um, I see what you're trying to do. And getting some productive time in. Well, I think a shortened schedule would probably be better. That way you're not missing that same two classes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a struggle. Um, but I, I think the shortened schedule would not work good, in my opinion. Because so, you get started. In yeah, absolutely. Well, so it would be better to so, put, uh, just say, next time we have, yeah, just rotate them through. And then it was, so you're not but the problem the is, it's just being able to do that. And when you've got shared teachers in other areas, it just makes it pretty difficult. And we haven't really discussed what we would do with oh, the yeah. schedule there. But, you know, we can work that out. Does that put kids through in activities in a position of missing the school last two hours? fairly frequently though. I mean like they leave early for competitions. Mm -hmm. Not on Wednesday though. No. But then then the yeah, Wednesday when they, when they Oh I see it then Friday yeah. they're going again, you know. Or Tuesday or whatever. And we we discussed uh, late start. Maybe starting school at ten o'clock instead. And uh, the issue there is we have a lot of kiddos eating breakfast here at school. They would miss that. Um, that morning time is the best instructional time to get those kids in uh, and get them right to learning. Uh, we'd be missing that time, so kind of agreed that afternoon time is the best. Another thing that, you know, besides that you're know, missing those afternoon classes is, you know, you have the, <clears throat> the kids that have practice after school, and we just miss them at 1.15 and they have to be back at 3.30. Um, I'll hang around town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or yeah, whatever their parents had them do. But, so uh, the buses would be going at one fifteen as normal. Likely, yes, but again, you know, I mean, you should say as normal, but out. I mean immediately. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe that's how it would would work out. We've done it all sorts of ways in the past. I don't, you know. I don't, it's been so long ago, it seems like that we've done that. Is the consensus that we're comfortable with this? Uh, well, the teachers think they can make it work. They're the ones who've got to put up with the students or have to work their learning in. So. Okay. I'm not asking you to approve this calendar tonight or anything. But. Time it's good to look at different ways. Okay, and then our work days, I don't really have a preference on this. Uh, this is just what we've had this year, a day and a half to get started, and then a half a day at the end of each quarter, and then uh, January could be different than a day and a half at the end. Um, the vacation days from our negotiated agreement are those days. Um, <clears throat> I just put these days, the student days and the contract days, because uh, I wasn't, I wanted to get the feeling of the board on this uh, when we go to looking at the uh, calendar. Um, this year, here's the days, uh, 164 and a half students in class. Um, one day is counted as parent-teacher conference, seven and a half staff development, and five work days. So it's 178 contract days. So I guess my question to you is, what do the contract days matter? Uh, is it important that we stick with that 178? Uh, I think last year was 177, and the year before that was 176, something like that. It's all been very close. So when we're building this calendar, is it important that we stick with those contracted days, or is that critical to you all? Does that become a new point of negotiation at the end between the contract? Yeah. Our contract's like 190 or something, isn't it? So 
Yeah, it's always. Ms. Kamen, mm -hmm. is that about sound right? I think it's about right. Yeah. It's 190 days in the yeah. negotiating agreement. Yeah. Okay. Here, um, on the next page there you have. Uh, so anything less than 190 days doesn't really require a new negotiation. Okay. Correct. Well, if we're at, if you think of it this way, we're at 178 this year. Um, changing those days would probably need some negotiating from what they've been paid this year. You know, requiring more days might be seen as, well, we need to be paid more. I guess if that makes sense. Regardless of whether it's 190. I think looking at this point now, to it's all a matter of interpretation when you're negotiating. Um, this other page here uh, shows the district comparisons. This is from 11-12, not this year. So we're two days higher. Two days higher. Let me give you a little of my philosophy. Uh, I think the longer we have kids in school, the better it is for them. They learn more. Um, I don't quote me as saying we need to go to school year round. You're saying, uh, when you uh, say that, you're talking about the number of days, not necessarily um, hours. Correct. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm not talking school day, I'm talking number of days. Uh, I think the shorter the spring break, the better it is. For their learning. There's learning loss in the summer. Uh, there is. Uh, and that's that learning loss is higher for kids from low income families. Uh, so that's where I'm coming from on that. Uh, but so this is the rough outline of our calendar for this year, if I can get it all in there. If we and what Mike's been working on is taking this year's calendar and trying to stick it in next year. Um, it basically puts it at ending here May 23rd and uh, starting here in August 26th. Uh, and a couple of things throw a wrench into the number of days. Well, if we, this year we came back on the 2nd with a work day in January and the kids came back on the 3rd. Well, that's kind of a tricky situation to be in if we have the kids come back for one day. Um, or the other thing is, if we cross this out at the 23rd, we could go to school on the 23rd. Um, so if we look at making this, uh, you know, work day here and then no school that day, that gives two weeks off at, at Christmas break, but you lose a couple of days. It's a couple of days less in the school year that way. So we don't have any decisions made. I haven't met with the calendar committee yet, but I wanted to get the feel from the board of contracted days, what is, uh, what ought we be looking at there, uh, or should we just be looking at fitting into start and end date? Uh, and any other input on what we ought to be working with the teachers on for the calendar committee? Any input or my input is see what everyone agrees on and bring it to us. Okay. That's my input. Everyone? Well they'll all like, they'll all pretty <laughs> much come together. We've, yeah. I think the teachers I've talked to like the later start in August. Right. Right. Yeah. I don't see it on. No, okay. I don't know. 
Okay, that's what we needed. A maintenance handbook and procedures. Okay, I'll be very brief here. Um, <clears throat> I'd hope to be further along on this. Uh, due to illness, I haven't been able to work with uh, with David on this. Uh, so, I'll just show you what we're after here. Um, I think the biggest thing with any of our issues comes down to communication um, on both ends of that. Communication from uh, from my office to everybody else and, and, and communicating our expectations. Uh, so that being said, the goal is to help with that and establishing those expectations and uh, communicating what, uh, what we expect out of everybody. Um, kind of outlining the chain of command there. Just general duties, what's important. Um, the priorities when we have limited staff, uh, what do we need to have done. And the issue is things need to be clean in the restroom and uh, need to be presentable and disinfected in the classroom. You know, keep kids from being sick, uh, drinking fountains and those things. Uh, because we do end up there uh, when we are short-staffed. Another item would be outlining our schedules and duties. And then everybody knows that. This would be a handbook that everybody can see, all the teachers see. Um, so everybody understands what everybody's role is on staff and then outlining a daily, weekly, monthly checklist of things that they all kind of have that. Uh, they know what they do day to day, um, but sometimes we don't know what that list is and the teacher doesn't know what that list is. And, uh, when do we dust this or clean that uh, if it's outside the regular duty? So. Uh, outlining those expectations for each area, restrooms and locker rooms, classrooms and so on. And, uh, and the grounds and some other items and inspection forms. Some of this I've stolen from other school districts. Uh, outlining expectations for activities, <coughs> and, uh, special things like snow removal. Then we have their job descriptions here for the head of maintenance and custodians. So that's kind of where we're headed with that. Again, I'd hope to be a little further along. So. All right. Now we're ready for number four, parents' teacher report. Turn it forward. And mm -hmm. um, thank you. Thank you for your time tonight. I always enjoy being in front of my USD 350 Board of Education. And um, always on behalf of parents as teachers, I want to thank you for committing a portion of your budget to early childhood, prenatal to three years old, as well as parent education and parent support in this community. Um, I'm in my ninth year of serving as a parent educator and St. John is in the 10th year of offering parents as teachers to people in this community. Um, I wanted to start off tonight, I put some of it up here, less paper. I'm not reading through all that data though, and thank you for zooming in. I just want the first two paragraphs there. Mr. Meyer um, talks about in 19, and this is just to remind us of why we have parents as teachers and why you've chosen to include it um, in our community. In 1990, Kansas made a wise first investment in families with children prenatal to age three. Since then, more than 220,000 Kansas children have benefited from Kansas parents as teachers. And then Parent Pad is designed to provide children the best possible start in life. Using research and based curriculum, my eyes are <laughs> Parents are provided with the skills and knowledge they need to help them make the best decisions regarding their child's development and education. The model includes personal visits, group connections, health, vision, hearing, and developmental screening, and supports family connections with other community services. 
Scoot down to the very bottom, please, Mr. Meyer, yeah. of the last paragraph. I'm going to just leave that down. By the way, this is taken from the KSDE website, which you can go to. And it's a good website that has, um, or the parents and teachers part is a good one on that website, easy to find. You scroll down to uh, choose a topic, and you find parents and teachers, and it gives you all the charts and information you'd ever want uh, to see. Anyway, the last paragraph, Kansas Pat is, um, where Kansas Pat is a valued partner with other home visiting and early childhood programs working together to promote easy access and high quality services to children and families in their communities. Um, one of the um, partners we work with is the uh, infant toddler early intervention, which we call Tiny K. Uh, and it, for this county, it is out of Great Bend. It's headquartered out of Great Bend. It's called Sunflower Diversified Services. And they serve five counties. And so that's one of the early childhood programs that um, parents as teachers collaborate with. And the next slide, Mr. Meyer, is uh, the goal, uh, goals of parents as teachers. Yeah. Um, increase parent knowledge of early childhood development and improve parenting practices. The second is to provide early detection of developmental delays and health issues, reduce child abuse, and increase children's school readiness and school success. And one example of helping with school readiness and school success is that Pat uh, builds pre-literacy skills. We model and encourage parents to talk and sing and read to their infants and toddlers. And we always have a book reading time together at uh, both home visits and play groups and leave books and give many books as we can uh, for the families to encourage reading. And in visits we model responding to their child in conversation, asking questions, explaining, etc. So that's just a tiny portion of some school readiness ideas that, that we have. And then uh, the next one move right on into looking at local information, which I know Board of Educations are always very interested in. Um, actually, this is the paper I always leave with you, so I'll go ahead and pass that around so you don't have to strain your eyes when you're straining up there. So, should go that way. Right now, the number of children enrolled in parents as teachers is 37, and the number of families enrolled in uh, USD 350 is 19 families, with the number of children being 25, down a couple from last year at this time. It, it fluctuates as we exit children as they turn three or move or, or whatever. And as you can see, that's about double from um, USD 349 which was the same last year, too. Um, of these 29 families, I included a few um, things there for you to see. There's one child with disabilities. Um, there's maybe two that have low educational attainment, which means no high school or GED in the family, in the parents. Um, a single parent, Spanish spoken in the home, or we enrolled uh, eight new children this year. We pointed two uninsured families to Health Wave, or which is called Can Care now. Um, and then the group connections and the play groups, which we offer. The group connections is the better word for meetings. If we called it a meeting, families probably wouldn't show up very much. But uh, anything from car seat check ins to CPR hands on classes for infant and toddlers, um, you know, week of the young child. Finger play, nursery rhyme groups, etc., etc. Potty training classes, and then the play groups. Um, we do offer the two daytime play groups in uh, St. John monthly, and two evening play groups in Stafford monthly. And I'll scoot on because the goals are stated here again on that sheet. And the last thing, um, the last slide is the new information. And I didn't know how much of this to share, but I thought because it's something that I thought would be really um, 
well, you care about it, but it won't make much sense. It, it's just to tell you things are very new for me the last couple of years because there's a lot of changes that are coming from the national PAT as well as KSDE. Number one, I've been working on this for about a year and a half or two years. By 2014, all PAT programs worldwide will have the choice to become an affiliate program or an approved user of the foundational curriculum. And in Kansas, if you are a PAT program and you want to receive the uh, KSD funds, you will be an affiliate program. Number two, this affiliate status brings with it many changes, many of which I have been working on for over a year, such as attending the new foundational training, implementing the new foundational curriculum, which is totally web-based. In the past, I had two folders that were about that wide each that had the PAT curriculum and now it's totally web-based, which brings with it challenges and hurrahs, so that's been good. Um, and it will be a $1,500 uh, charge per program yearly, now and a $225 per parent educator yearly. So that's all with that out of the national. Um, then, about the time National was rolling that out, then KSD, Kansas, rolled out uh, their implementation of what they call Foundations for School Success, or FSS. And FSS is a web-based data system designed to provide key data that will inform decision-making to benefit children, families, and the PAT program. That involves obtaining and entering data on PAT children and families if they sign off to do that. It involves obtaining a Kansas individual data on students or a kid's number idea, now even for PAT children. So we're starting, they're starting that data collection now as early as early childhood. And that is it. I know you have some questions, so I will see if you do. I'll let me thank you. So the individual data on students, is that integrated with <coughs> whatever is on the contract? Yes, it is. And I had been uh, correspondence with the two superintendents when that started rolling out to see how we would do that and enter that data. And so when that number uh, is entered at early childhood level, it will be the number that goes with them to whatever school district they're in. And the neat part of my presentation I just botched because it's always the beautiful pictures I bring and of the children and that didn't happen today so I apologize. <laughs> Anything else? Send them to me in an email and I'll send it with my Friday note. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. It's kind of interesting. They're really, I mean, it's basically, I interpret this as we're starting school from the get go, zero three, mm -hmm. and There's, yet we're we're funding it separately. You know what I mean? It's kind of like we don't we don't talk about funding for third grade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I think <laughs> the parents as teachers is more focusing on the parents trying yeah. to help them right, to help them interact. To children. teach your children from zero to three, and then from three on up. So well, the child starts at six. I saw an interesting statistic you had up on your first slide up here on the mm -hmm. bottom right hand side. Mm -hmm. That obesity or something? No, oh, it had to do with 15%, less oh. than 15% of the kids that are eligible are, are, are utilizing this. What do it you is. think that is in Stafford County? I ask myself this all the time. I, I ask even somewhat the disparity right now between my two districts, and it has been flip-flopped in the past, you know, I don't know. Um, right now, in word of mouth is one of my best things, families telling families, teachers suggesting to families. I, I get some families that say, this isn't for me, and you know, I, I just, let me tell you a little bit more about it. Um, Hopefully it could be for you to learn more about your child and their developmental stages, birth to three, when their brain is growing incredibly. And um, 
I don't know what that block is, but it's it's statewide, nationwide. Well, because you know this is one of the stages that you know identify, identifying kids to help parents, especially educationally, if they're not able to keep up, so that they can get help. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just don't. I wonder. I wonder what the correlation is between uh, parents that were raised in, had to go to, or were identified, I'll put it that way, in school as they were growing up and don't want their child to be part of this because they're afraid that they're going to have that. Because mm -hmm. those parents carry that for the rest of their lives and they don't want to put on their child. It'd be interesting to see if that might be a what's stopping some of them is saying, hey, I had to do that in high school, I don't want my kid having to do that in high school. Yeah. And, you know, right, right. And so part of it is getting to know the families and letting them know that developmental screenings are at their, their option, uh, why it's a good thing, why early identification of any delays or anything of that sort, the earlier the better. Um, and I don't think they perceive this program as my coming in to, to screen them and then decide if they have that, because certainly that's not my area anyway to do that. But it's to see where they might be able to identify areas to help them along, whether it's in a motor skill or a language, even social-emotional behavior. So, I don't know, maybe it's just lack of, you know, really getting the word out there. That's what I struggle with all the time, so. Where the referral comes from might make a difference. I, mm -hmm. just my own experience with it, the referral I got was from a family with a, just a very, I don't know, very strong family with, without probably issues with deficiencies or something like that. I didn't perceive it as a program addressing deficiencies. It was a program that was teaching parents and mm -hmm. fun, right, and um, I think that in a different context I might have perceived it as more governmental and, and you know, maybe had some um, trepidation with inviting someone that I thought might be more enforcement oriented into my home or something like that, but I never the context that I learned about it in, and, and your way of carrying it out was not that way at all. And so it was very positive, but yeah, you kind of wonder if they think that might, you might be more on the social services side and coming to check I, things out. Right. I've had just one family out of all the nine years that has ever asked me that. And, you know, I kind of blew me away, and I absolutely talked with them, and she took the information, shared it with her husband, and visited it to see. Uh, and, and they participated in the program. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'd say parents are their child's best and first teachers. That is what I, um, what this program promotes, and that's why I'm working with them. Yeah, I think the best that. thing is kind of feedback to me, not necessarily as right. entering. My into kids it. have enjoyed it. Oh, <laughs> the grandkids. So. It's, I know I try, to tell, I try to tell Cheryl every time somebody is bored in the area so yeah. she can maybe give them a call. I appreciate that. I have referrals right now in St. John and Stafford coming from uh, teachers and some families that say, hey, I know about this. And I read the newspapers. I try to find out who's born. <laughs> but um, anyway, anything else that... Thank you for coming and sharing with us this evening. Thank you. Nine years. Oh, is that right? <laughs> Next item on our business is 2013-14 preschool. Okay, we're getting closer to uh, uh, maybe having a solution for our preschool situation. We've got numbers in, if you remember. Uh, uh, Mrs. Saylor Siefke sent out a a letter uh, around the community to gauge interest in uh, preschool. 
here's uh, some things that are important to understand. Uh, we as a board need to understand that, and also the community needs to understand it. But why would this be a priority for us? Um, first, we're not serving all students that want to. We've got a, a lot of kids that, that want to be here, parents want them here, and uh, they're not able to be here. Uh, eight students started kindergarten this year uh, with no preschool at all. Uh, if you think about that, uh, and the difference in kids' ability at that age and the time we have to spend, we hold the kids that are ready back uh, to bring these others back. And I'm not saying the eight that didn't go to preschool are in that situation, but uh, it makes it more likely that we have that situation. Uh, preschool prepares students to be successful when they enter kindergarten. And I included some research here uh, on some of the benefits. Um, also uh, related to the fact that preschool saves future costs. If you think about the money we spend on special education, uh, remediating kids if they're held back, uh, dropout, high school dropouts and those things, not only costs for us, it's difficult for a small district like us to put a number on what are we spending on remediating students on their reading in second grade because they didn't go to preschool. That's tough to put a number on. Uh, nationwide and statewide, it, it may be a little easier. I'm not going to uh, regurgitate all this research here to you, but it, it's it's pretty clear on the benefits of uh, preschool. Uh, this one here kind of puts it into perspective with uh, money we put into preschool eventually saves money uh, down the road, and this is a, a, a study here about special education and the reduced need for that. Um, and again, that doesn't save us a lot of dollars as far as special ed, but um, on a statewide basis and for our cooperative, it would. Um, also important for us to understand is where we are now. We have the Bridges to Learning uh, program right now. That's funded through the special education co-op. They hire the personnel. Students need to be identified as having special needs for that. Uh, we have 18 students this year that have identified needs. We also have what, what we call peer models, which are the students that don't have an identified uh, need uh, that don't necessarily qualify, but we can include them in the program. Uh, there's 10. We also uh, have to serve students from Maxville because they don't have a special ed preschool. Uh, some of the kids that they can't serve there. Uh, if the needs are so severe that they can't handle with their, uh, their staff, the special ed cooperative places them here because we do have a staff that can handle those needs. Um, the early learning communities, that uh, is the grant that we had looked at uh, maybe becoming a part of. It braids funding sources together with preschool at risk. That's funding provided by the state, uh, Head Start, which is income qualifications uh, there and is very rigorous in the things that are provided uh, as far as home visits and meals and things like that. Uh, a lot of hoops to jump through. And then the special education. Um, Ten of our students, of our USD 350 students, attend Stafford's Preschool now. They have a morning section and an afternoon section. Uh, numbers for next year, we have 45 kiddos that would be three, four, or five that have expressed interest that responded to our survey. Um, five of them, uh, we had question marks, some we weren't sure if they would be coming here or coming at all. Um, and then five of those would be eligible for kindergarten may choose to go the kindergarten route, may choose to go special, or uh, the preschool. Anything to add so far? Okay. Um, met with them over at Stafford. They have the two sections now, and 10 of our kiddos are there now. Uh, if we would add a section, that may affect what they do. So if, if we add a section and serve all of our kids here, uh, they're not sure that they would have two sections. So, um, 
we had looked at do we want to be a part of that early learning communities grant which would include Head Start. Again, we didn't want to take on that role and try to learn something new um, in that amount of time, maybe down the road, uh, but we did make the decision that that's not for us right now. So we do have these options that if we could add another half section um, that could be part of our Bridges to Learning, we would likely have to fund that teacher. Um, uh, there may be some potential for funding through the special ed co-op. They do get some preschool funding from the state. Uh, that's not an option anymore. We can't apply to the state to get preschool funding uh, because we're not part of that now. There's no new funding available. Uh, but the special ed co-op does have some of that funding that we may be able to uh, take advantage of. Uh, another option would be if we move one section of the Stafford Early Learning Communities uh, preschool over here. Now, I just said we didn't really want to be a part of that, but it may be an option that it's still the Stafford program it, and it's all funneled through them, Head Start paperwork, all the hoops to jump through stay there. We uh, just move that classroom here. Uh, there's a lot a lot of what ifs um, there. And then we could just choose to be a part of that early learning community uh, on our own and not funnel it through Stafford. But again, that's that's a tough thing to, to try to accomplish. That is this different than from the funding that's no longer available? If it was funded through them, oh yes, yes. But the, the ELC grant is the source of funding that is no longer available? Or no, no, no. The preschool at-risk funding. The state provides funding for at-risk students in preschool. Okay. For four-year-old at-risk students. Okay. That's the funding that's not available. So, what if we do this? Um, Well, we need to determine what our facility needs are um, and what a solution would be. Um, we do have some options for another classroom uh, that could be possible. Uh, there would likely be some minor expenses for room renovation. Uh, the likelihood of getting any construction done between now and the start of school would be uh, very difficult. Uh, Where would that room be located? Okay. Um, probably, we've tossed out a few options. The room that is near the elementary office is used as computer lab, science room. Uh, we would need to find another location for computers. But that room is available. It would need some carpet, some renovating. Uh, there would be some costs associated there. Um, other solutions I don't want to discuss right here because it involves uh, sensitive issues that uh, I'll bring up later. But other question on that? Part? I'll wait. Okay. See what you have to say. Okay. Um, and then determining the costs, we would have recurring costs uh, of a half time teacher depending on the arrangement with Stafford and what's possible there and what's, uh, what they're willing to do. Uh, maybe a half-time paraprofessional. Uh, we may be able to shuffle some special ed paras. We need to determine numbers there to know for sure. And one-time costs, we would need to supply the room with materials and maybe renovate some. The big question is, can we afford this? And that's the answer I don't know right now. And that's the big hang up. Yeah. Well, Along with that money, there with the special ed co-op funneling some money with that stuff that they had with their health care costs going where it was, how could they have money to? This would be funnel. different money. Um, that's no, that would be just their general operating money uh, for personnel expenses. They receive money for preschool from the state that has to be spent on preschool. Okay. So they don't right. have the option to pay insurance costs with that. Okay. Anyway. All right. Okay. 
Okay, that makes sense. Could there be a possibility of, um, and I know some schools charge for kids to come to preschool. Mm -hmm. Maybe working at as a, I don't want to say private preschool, but a paying preschool, but renting a room from our school to this person so they can have their classroom in the school district. Uh, but people would have to pay to come to yeah. the preschool. Yes, like, I don't know the answer to that. If I, I haven't looked into that. Well, I just we used to have a preschool here yeah. in town, mm -hmm. and they only met Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I think. But right. took that concept, but put them in our school and just rented the teacher right. a room. Yeah. Because I know several parents told me that they would pay to have their child. Yeah. Go to preschool. And we've talked. Want that. We've discussed even uh, to help with the affordability from the district standpoint is having kids pay. The struggle there is um, uh, they can go to Stafford right now for free as long as that grant holds out and the transportation grant holds out. Um, they can take advantage of that. But. If they choose to, you know, for free. Yeah. Um, the other you know, issue that's is the it's, choice. it's hard for us to wrap our brains around making kids, making parents pay for public education, and, I understand. and when we have other kids getting the same thing for free, that's been a tough thing for us to. Well, that, I, that's what I mean. If you did it the other way around, and right. the teacher was mm -hmm. actually having preschool but renting the room from the school, right. maybe that wouldn't mm -hmm. be. I was just thinking of the access to the buildings if you're not an employee. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, there would be a lot of workers, workmen's comp. I mean, there's a hundred issues there we'd have to look at. And does something like workers' comp play into that if they're. Well, somebody told me that Otis Bison, they paid $250 to send their kids to preschool, but, and that's regular preschool. I don't know if they have a co-op situation yeah. up there where some get to go for free and some don't. Right. So. Yeah. We have the weird situation here where you just, uh, you, you hope and pray that your kid needs special education services so you get to go to preschool. <laughs> and that's, yeah. And it's, I mean, it's kind of silly, but, and I don't mean it to be that way, but that's the situation we're in. Yeah. I want my kid to go to preschool because Have a I know the benefits, going. but uh, <laughs> we're turning kids away. And well, I wonder, you know, like Mays has the, the early childhood, the regular program, and then special ed, and then yeah. they intermingle as the day goes through, so they can, so I don't know if the kids that go to the regular ed side are paying and yeah. the other ones are not. Yeah. So that would yeah. be interesting to see. I mean, can, that's a big thing. Can school. anyone yeah. go that wants to, or are they limited on space? No, anybody can go. But they have like five classrooms, so, yeah. you know, they take in a large population. So any other questions on the preschool? No. So what, are, what are you considering the scope of funding needed in total? I mean, like. Um, I didn't put that on here. I had a, a vague idea, um, uh, roughly twenty-five thousand for a teacher, um, eight for a para. So ongoing, you know, thirty-five max. Uh, I think it's very important for us to have that option to bring in young families to our community. I, I they they want to see it in the school. Based on the data, I think we need it. Huh? Based on the data that we have. Well, I'm sending here, 10 kids to Dom. How far ahead you the, the kid is if he goes to preschool mm -hmm. throughout his educational career. Right. And <clears throat> you couple that with our Parents as Teachers program, we give our kids from birth to kindergarten they've got something available uh, from the time they breathe air. We'll, we'll be teaching them to read. <laughs> so, I think it should be pursued. And, and they, 
the, the big part of the budget is when we're talking salary cost, that's every year. Um, 25000 in our size of budget isn't a lot of money, but $25,000 every year is a tough thing where we take that from. Um, and that's where we're at now is how do we pay for this? Well, the six more kids a year will get from having the appealing option of going to preschool here. <laughs> Well, there you go. I'm all for that, too. Are you having twins or what? <laughs> 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 Andre, anything else that um, we missed? I don't think you missed anything. I just really want to reiterate, and I think I'm getting a feeling from the board, I think every child here that wants to go to preschool should be able to come to a high-quality preschool. Right now, we're offering very high-quality programming. I'm very proud of that. The kids are getting left out, and I don't, I don't want to see. Um, and our ten kids that are at Stafford are getting high quality education, and I'm very thankful that they got that grant and are able to do that. We just need to make sure that every kid that wants a spot has a spot. So, um, and I, for me, it's important that it's free for everybody. We're treating everybody equal. Um, I don't want to find myself in a situation where I'm seeing kids take a bus to another school because they can't pay. I don't want to see that kind of segregation happening here. So that's just my opinion, and you now I've said it out loud. So mm -hmm. that's all I had to add. I'd like to see it free too, but I'd also like to see it. Period. Either way, you know, so. And, um, Andre has been working very hard on this issue and sometimes reminds me that I, when I see dollars and cents, and she reminds me that it takes heart too. <laughs> I think we need to take care of the patrons in our community and the future of our schools and the young ones that are coming into it right now. And that's, we need to focus on that. So mm -hmm. I think this is something we need to focus on real, real heavily in the next few months. I agree. I agree too. I hope to have a decision by March. I can't guarantee that when we're talking uh, budget. But that's the goal. Okay, we'll move on to added agenda items, curriculum leadership institute contract. Um, I mentioned at the last meeting we really need to do something uh, beyond what we can offer as administrators to get our curriculum developed. Uh, we've been in a situation, and a lot of schools have, this isn't unique to St. John by any means, uh, that where the state standards become our curriculum and what we teach, and we focus narrowly on what's tested. Why did we do that? Because of No Child Left Behind, and that's how we measured success. Here's the curriculum, we take this much that's tested and we really focus on that. We're getting away from that. Um, we can't just have the standards tell us everything we're going to teach and when we're going to teach it. That's what curriculum is. That's our responsibility as a district to provide that direction. Um, it's a difficult spot where we're in to try to get that all put together. And we want it to be more than writing the curriculum and, okay, here it is, we put it on the shelf, and then what do we do with it? Um, the Curriculum Leadership Institute, I've been very familiar with this uh, for a lot of years. Um, I've never been through the process myself as an administrator, but again, I'm familiar with it. I, I included a lot of information here, but this model is set up where we have a council that governs our, governs our curriculum. Uh, nothing. Uh, not like a, a monthly meeting or a weekly meeting or anything uh, like that. But we would have a, uh, a council that oversees the curriculum. Each subject area would have their own uh, committee of teachers that work on that curriculum. The idea is that you have shared interest in that. It's more than just, well, Mr. Wood knows the high school math curriculum, and when he leaves, somebody else has got to learn about it. 
It's that we all understand it, we all know about it, and that carries on uh, continually with board input and parent input. I'm not going to go through all of this, um, the steps here. Um, if you've had time to review some of that, and this is a general document here, the one with the, the color and everything. Page 42 is what's been proposed for our district. Um, now let me say this, I, uh, my goal is to always uh, never ask for action on an item uh, the first time we really see the material. I think that's fair to board members to uh, discuss it one month and take action on it the next month. So if you don't feel comfortable giving me authority to enter a contract, I'm okay with that. We can do it next month. Um, but this is what's been proposed. Um, on a reduced schedule. Their fee is 30, about $32,000 a year to go through the full process. We cannot afford that. Uh, that's a huge expense. So reduced number of days, um, it'll be about $13,000 a year. Have them come in and do some summer work, do some work periodically throughout the year, uh, which you can see, which is laid out here uh, for the language arts would be one year, and, uh, and then math. So the language arts subject area committees, and then the math subject area committees would meet periodically to build that curriculum. Um, to get that price, that reduced price, we'll need to contract with them for two years. They want to know we're committed. Um, I'm not ready to make that decision now, but I will be in a couple of weeks. I'm talking with ESDAC about what they have to offer uh, for building curriculum. I have worked with ESDAC on building curriculum in the past. Uh, it's not this detailed. Um, it's more of a, let's build the curriculum, and then you take it from there. This Curriculum Leadership Institute is, let's teach you how to build the curriculum and teach you how to govern it and continue the process periodically. Um, ESDAC would be about, um, maybe not quite a third, uh, less than half the cost of that. So, so what I'm asking for, if the board is okay with it, to allow me to enter a two-year contract. I can't enter into a contract with anybody, the board has to do that. But you can authorize me to do that uh, if I make that decision here in the next couple of weeks. So, to reiterate, I'm looking at ESDAC. Um, and they don't have the information to me yet on what they have to offer, but we do have this information. So when I make that decision, if the board would grant me that authority, I would enter that two-year contract with that Curriculum Leadership Institute. How do we pay for it is the other question. That would be a good chunk of our professional development budget for two years. Uh. How the teachers here locally would have all the jurisdiction on decisions and things. They like would that. yes, they would be doing the work. Yeah. Well, I started kind of researching some of these people that they're talking about the <coughs> curriculum and stuff. And I, I'm kind of worried about what some of their backgrounds are of the people that they talk about and things. So, Ralph Tyler. There's one of them. I personally would like to take a little longer to study this and find out what all is their basis of their what they're talking about on the curriculum. Okay. Side of it. Yeah, the the curriculum isn't based on anybody's uh, uh, any one theory. It's yeah, We're developing the curriculum, so. But this theory is just a little on the okay. shady side. Okay. I'm not sure I'm reconciling very well the idea of Common Core standards, which mm -hmm. are much more. My my understanding is much more objective, broad, mm -hmm. based, not so much a specific listing of things that. And and this I. 
I'm not sure I, I understand how this this um, strikes me as curriculum with more of a listing of things you are covering. That's curriculum. Standards would be what we expect them to know and be able to do, and from that curriculum says how do we get there? What are the activities we we do? Okay. Uh, what activities, what instructional practice, uh, not instructional practice, what activities get us to those standards? So when they say common core curriculum, they're really That's getting more standards. at standards. Yes. Got it. Yeah. And I will just, I'll, with uh, Barb not being comfortable with that situation, we'll just hold off until next month. I'd like to see what OSTEC has to offer. I know it probably won't be as extensive as okay. this, but... Is this um, software or no. handouts? Or they, they'll have materials, but it's more the process of taking us through the process. Of the training. Yes, they will be here, yes. That's what we're paying them for. And in the end, we will be trained on the... Uh, curriculum development and how we continue to develop it over the years and we'll have a curriculum in hand. And how is this compared to what we do now, teachers do now, or don't do? I, I'm lost a little well, bit. Well, how did, <coughs> ask the principals, how do, how do our teachers know what, what needs to be taught right now? For the last 10, 12 years we've been uh, basing on the state standards. Right. And we know when to teach those. When to teach those standards, what are, what are indicated, what are dealt in, to indicate what will be on the state assessments when you go through. Right. And they have academic free, freedom as to how they get to those standards. And we don't, we're getting away from those standards now. So we have a textbook that Mrs. Kinneman has yeah. And you not take the textbook and you start at chapter one and work through it. And mm -hmm. if we do, that's that's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Is that then the textbook becomes our curriculum, which is not what we and, want. But and you supplement stuff in as you go. And, and how do we know what to supplement? That's the point. Is the curriculum should guide us? The curriculum would be what the school board. And the community says, we want taught. Otherwise, we're saying, we want uh, McGraw-Hill's textbook taught for our math. Well, what's in that? Well, it should fit with our curriculum, not vice versa. If that makes sense. I think about it for a while. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you got to think about it for a while. Why do you think it is, past teacher? Um, I, I, I think it's appropriate at this time, especially since we got away from the state standards to the common core standards, this is appropriate for teachers to look at. And it's a, it's a process. It's not something you just develop overnight. And I think it's good for our teachers to go through and really evaluate what they're teaching and how they're teaching it, what's necessary. Because I think still today there are, there are teachers that teach chapter one through chapter twelve, period. And I've heard people say, Well, I'm not even to chapter two yet. Is this group of kids? They're still on chapter one. Well, why are you on chapter one if it's not relevant? The question is, is we need to find what the relevancy is is it necessary to be taught, so forth. So I think it's a, you need to think of it more of an evaluation of what's being taught at the age level with the common core standards in mind. And I, I, I think we're on the, the right track. I, it, there's a dozen different ways to do this stuff. And I would say I feel very comfortable listening to what Josh is talking about here, uh, since he's heard about it and done a little research on work on it, yeah, you may not agree with everything about a particular person.
person, but the whole thing's not based on one person. Well, it's really based on what your teachers do with the information that's being presented to them, and that's the bottom line. I agree with that. I just, you know, this just the little research that I've done with it is is uh, I don't know his. Uh, design of the greater outlook, his greater outlook, to me is just what I believe. And if he's the only, he's the only person I've looked at so far, and I think, you know, if he's, they're using a lot of his bases of curriculum and instruction, then what are these other guys, are they all filing in suit with him and his, his, is his it ideals. the idea of progressive process, or is it content that that is more like progressive and well and maybe controversial? Okay. Like um, the the progressive word set me off. That's why I looked at him first. In one of the articles, and I realized, you know, you can't believe everything on the internet. So you got to kind of start reading all different things, but. He was making a comment about belief drives behavior, which I agree, mm -hmm. but to me that's probably right. But then he goes on to say that if we start teaching children at K, gosh, I kind of hate to say this, to hate capitalism, then by 12th grade they'll have the, their behavior already set. And I think what, what they're getting at here with Ralph Tyler and how that fits in here is those four points there and the point of curriculum, um, which is those four. What, what is education for and so on? How do we term, determine if those purposes are being attained? And for curriculum, what does that mean? Identifying objectives, selecting the means for attainment of those object, objectives. What are, what textbook are we going to use that fits with our curriculum? And I, you know, it's, then, it's just, I, I, if the teachers have the yes. control over the curriculum, yes. I have full faith in our teachers that they're not yeah. going to teach them something that any of us mm -hmm. are against. Sure. But, just like he said, belief drives behavior. If he can keep changing, well, he's dead now, but, you know, if the education yes. can keep changing the beliefs, of you know the people in education along the way, then pretty soon the behavior starts changing along with it. And you know who's to say that some of this hasn't already creeped into a lot of this? Well, it obviously has. I mean, there's schools that are having big issues with some of the things that are coming out in the curriculum that their kids are learning. So, you know, in the bigger schools, right. I'm just trying to, uh, you know, I, I, the, it might be a good program. I would just like to look at it just one more month sure. and just yeah. find out what else they Well, I, I don't think that they're going to drive, <clears throat> because it'll all be done locally, what is actually being taught materialistic. It's the process of going, evaluation of going through this. How does that process um, transition um, to new teaching staff when retirements occur, for example, especially when you've got departments which in some cases are pretty much just one person. Right. Well, and that's the idea with this system is with the, the committee and that periodically reviews the curriculum, it's not just people getting together, writing the curriculum and moving on. It would be each year and then that would be up to us as a district to make sure that happens. But each year revisiting that curriculum and does this still fit? And you're new. Let's get you up to speed. Uh, that's the idea, at least. So it might require for someone teaching math to be some pretty familiar with, I don't know, shop or something. No, not necessarily. No, uh, it would be like a math subject area committee. Uh, we're just focused on math and English language arts right now. Uh, we're not ready to tackle every subject. Okay, I will bring it up uh, next meeting. I'll get you, you additional information as I as I have it.
Because of our additional enrollment, we need to republish the general fund budget. That's the only one we will need to republish. It doesn't require action, but I'd feel more comfortable if we uh, had a motion. What does this mean for us, uh, money-wise? A good chunk of the enrollment, the, the additional funds we get, we need to send on to ESDAC, because that's the Learning Center folks. We pay them to to teach those uh, learning center classes. So in reality, it's about 15,000 additional dollars in the general fund. Uh, 84,000 total, we pass on 69,000 of that. Uh, what it does mean though, next year we'll have an additional 30,000 in our local option budget that we will have access to. On this uh, notice of hearing, it needs to be 845. I've made the change on the one we're gonna publish, but we probably ought to note that here, that the hearing time is not 7, it's 8.45. That's a regular night of our board meeting? Yes. Yeah. I'll explain to you in my report why it's going to be 8.45. Need a motion? I would like to motion. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, I'll move the board approve the publishing of the amended budget as presented. Second. Then move and second to approve the publishing of the amended budget as presented. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, right hand. For the same sign, 6-0. Communications. We'll begin with Board Member Chad. Communications, um, before last month, I uh, contacted several people about filling out a Monsanto grant for our school district trying to drum up support for that. The more people that apply, the better chance we have of getting it. So that's what I've been doing. Can you recall the deadline on that? Since uh, April, but it's a month or two out. Yeah. We have time. Mm -hmm. Is there a specific application that other people need to endorse? Or does everyone need to take an action to present Monsanto an idea? It's a template you, just, you fill it out. It's not mine. Yeah. We don't have a grant application yet. Okay. The school would have something that they're applying for, and then basically everyone in the community needs to chime in to mm -hmm. say, please fund it. Okay. Basically, you need to put USB 350 in the slot. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mark? You said enough to know. I need a report. Last month, I uh, told a little bit about one of our soil types in the county that was. Um, Somehow, um, back in 2009, when uh, NRCS went from uh, alpha soil type names to numeric, uh, they added a whole bunch of soils. And uh, one of our soils in the county uh, consists of 10.3% of the county, and it was classified as waste. And uh, this has been going on since 2009. And here two weeks ago, Carl Miller went to Topeka and talked to the people there about it. And he'd been talking to them every year since 2009. But uh, he got a letter from NRCS in Salina saying that it was a mistake, that it was not waste soil, it was productive cropland and uh, yeah so anyway um, the use value on this soil will go from ten dollars an acre to 41 uh, for I'm assuming the next time there's taxes collected on it and the evaluation for the county uh, just in that mistake there alone 
will go up $2.9 million. And then the irrigated ground, uh, we're going to have to wait another year for NRCS to do some work on that. And thought maybe it would, everything being equal, it would go up to $115 an acre instead of what is now 41 on that. So we would be able to, with the same mills, either some people's taxes will go down, some go up, or one mill will bring in more money for the capital outlay stuff and, and that. So uh, it only took four years to get that part done. Pretty speedy. <laughs> but uh, Car Carl had uh, talked to me about it and, and then we met with Rita, the uh, next door to me, and we kind of got the ball rolling for him and helped him out to get that fixed. But the representative soil uh, that was used nationwide was in Oklahoma, and it was swamp land. It was basically a wetland, and that's very similar in characteristics, but it's productive soil here, fairly productive, and there it was junk, and so that's why uh, that happened. And they knew that there was the problem there, but no one would do anything about it until about two weeks ago. And so all the appraisers that have this soil type were going to get a letter to where they had the authority to reclassify their land the way it should be. And you know, good examples was that uh, irrigated quarter out here and the taxes on it were a fourth of what a dry land quarter could be across the road just because of the difference in the different soil, soil types. The, the irrigated was considered waste in the dry land you're paying four times the taxes on or something, so it was a definite error that needed to be fixed. Um, met with the special ed director. You, um, I'm a glutton for punishment. Or the railroad train just came through, but I will be doing the negotiation for the special ed co-op. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be done. Uh, it's not going to be a fun time because of the tight uh, budget of the uh, then having to pay for health insurance. It will be uh, a very difficult time, but I'm confident that through some just um, good numbers that we can just be able to convince people uh, to treat everybody on the same level playing field. There'll have to be some give and take on both sides. But we, we will have to do it to uh, meet the federal mandate of Obamacare. So, uh, other than that, this usual stuff is the special ed co op meeting. Do you have anything on that? No. It's a short one. Um, also, this last uh, month I attended the committee uh, advisory board meeting in, in Topeka um, for career and technical education. I'm still serving on that committee. Um, approved another pathway uh, in law enforcement, which we don't have here in Wichita. But, um, they're reviewing the curriculums uh, the, and so forth in career and technical education field, those are ongoing to meet the federal mandates there. Um, you'll see some changes uh, coming up in the next uh, year as they look at um, this thousand dollar funding, what jobs, uh, 
how they come about, those particular, I don't know how those jobs in demand, another term they use. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, how they determine that in the state of Kansas and why the thousand dollars gets put on certain people to um, the refund. So a lot of interesting things coming about. Uh, the governor's budget has a lot to do with what's going on up there. But they are listening to career and tech ed. Um, so it's kind of the committee itself is getting restructured because there's several people that have left it, at least half of them. So I'm still one of the original ones, about 15 years on it. So. It's kind of interesting. Other than that, I don't have anything else to report in there. So we'll move on to administrative reports. Start with the high school principal. Let's see. On your iPads, <laughs> you can see enrollment pretty, pretty much consistent with what it's been. We started the school year with 154 and 156. We have a, a parent came today, so we may have a new student starting here shortly. Um, we're still working on that. Um, the Scholars Bowl team had some, um, performed, uh, got fourth in CPL, and then they participated in regionals last week. And the top three get to go to state, and if they finished tied for third. I talked to Joel, but then they lost in a tiebreaker. So we ended up fourth, and so we ended up going back to state. So we were really close. So it's sort of kind of cool. Um, National Honor Society induction is on the 17th, the auditorium. Um, on Wednesday, the 16th, we met uh, 7th through 12th grade, met with um, law enforcement officials, police chief, uh, people and sheriff, highway patrol, Steve Booty. Came out about school safety and some procedures, and we'll continue working on that as we go through the year. Um, the Kansas Honors Program is Wednesday evening, and those are the students that will be attending. Um, we used to, we used to. Um, this is the first year we used to go to uh, Larned. Up until this time, we've always gone to Larned, and we've been there with five schools, I think. And now we're we're going to now go to Great Bend, and there, I think there's 12 or 13 schools at this point. So. It'll be the same program. It'll just be a, they're just condensing it, I guess, into, into a bigger area. So that'll be that's a nice honor. That's a nice program for the kids. Um, February 25th, we have, I believe, when I talked to Wendy, 29 or 30 students at this point that will be attending the Rack Academic Olympics. Uh, we uh, have been talking about um, setting up some opportunities. For online classes for students in high school, um, albeit uh, college credit classes, uh, Hutch, Barton, Brad, uh, whether we use uh, soft, whether we purchase software to put on the, on those computers so that kids can also take classes that way, as another way to fit into their schedule. Um, Larned has one that they have set up for different. You know, we'll visit that uh, and talk to the principal over there about how they do theirs. And give them see that it'll, how it would work here for us. Um, sixth through eighth grade music festival was on the 15th. Um, working on the 13-14 calendar as you all saw earlier. Looking at class schedule stuff as we get closer to that I'll start looking at that. <clears throat> and you all should have a activity account report. Any questions or anything? <coughs> How many kids are going to be inducted into the our society this year? Do you know? We, the committee meets on. Is it Friday morning? The committee meets Friday morning. Okay. We haven't been selected yet. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. Um, as Mr. Bergen said, we had Chief Sailor uh, in the building. Uh, he came through. Yeah and talk to pre-K through six kids, January 25th and 26th, uh, room by room. <coughs> he did a very nice job, um, you know, talking to kids about, you know, we prepare for a fire by doing fire drills, and, you know, if any of you have ever seen a fire in school, well, you know, no, but we still do those drills, and 
we're going to do lockdown drills for the same reason. You know, we're going to be safe in case something ever happens. Probably won't, but we're going to be ready. Um, and it, the kids responded very well to him. Um, Kansas Day activities, it was awesome. We had just a really fun Kansas Day. Um, the Lucille Hall Museum had quite a few activities out for the kids to do. Um, Mr. Cooper and Mrs. Gail Cornwell worked with the second graders. They had some songs, some poetry, some dancing, and did performances for the other elementary grades. Uh, it was really neat. Um, we co opted with Mrs. Patterson and her class. They made Kansas State cookies for us. So I just thought it was a really neat celebration of Kansas. Um, the kids did a great job. Spelling Bee. Um, was actually Thursday on the 31st after a quick little reschedule there, but the first, second, and third place winners are listed. First and second are repeats from last year, so we've got some solid spellers here in the county. PE program's coming up March 4th, so before the board meeting will be the PE program, so I am just expecting all of you to be there and have some fun with PE program on that evening. State assessments are starting in February. Um, I've got a couple teachers that are going to get those assessments right when the window opens mid-February. So we're going to get going on those. And again, um, third and fourth grade are not only giving the regular, whatever, traditional state assessments that we're used to, they're also doing some pilots for the Smarter Balance testing. Um, so those kids are really going to put their assessment time. Um, administrative, um, actually very busy day for us. Um, I'm expecting a new fourth grader tomorrow that doesn't show up on this report, and I'm expecting a new sixth grader tomorrow that doesn't show up on this report, and I've got a new preschooler. So um, what a difference a day makes. Um, anyway, uh, pre-K we talked about already with Mr. Meyer. Um, and even though the deadline for that interest inventory was January 18th, I'll get a new one every day or so. You know, they're still filtering in. Um, as all of us who deal with data and requesting information know, I mean, those numbers are uh, moving around. Anyway. Um, our site council PTO meeting was this evening at 6. Um, uh, they are planning to um, provide some treats in the classroom for our kids during state assessment time um, and also some appreciation things for our teachers um, you know we're talking popcorn and apple juice kind of things but uh, I think very nice gesture um, for our students and teachers during that time um, they are still very interested in seeing the playground um, get some grass get that going um, so of course we're interested to hear um, how you all are going to be prioritizing any kind of major projects and what we might need to take on as a site council PTO. Um, you know, as spring is getting near. Our next meeting will be March 4th at 3.30. Uh, again, the change in time due to that PE program. So, because we'll all be busy in the evening before the board meeting and before the PE program. 21st uh, Century Learning Centers coming up. We did not make the first cut, um, but we got our grant back with suggestions, and we can reapply, and that is our plan. That reapplication is due February 15th. So um, I'm, I'm pleased that we got the suggestions back, and um, Nurse Cornwall is very encouraged, you know, to get those changes made and get that get that in again. So. Um, other things, um, Cheryl's already gone, but again, I'm, I'm so thankful that we have Cheryl Foster in our PAT program here. She does an excellent job, um, and I get to see the play groups here in St. John a couple times a month. Um, it's a neat group, and she is a great support for parents and, and kids here in our community, and just a great person to work with. Um, this is School Counselor Appreciation Week. Um, and so I want to publicly thank our elementary school counselor, Mrs. Kim Volker. She does a great job. She works really hard. Um, she's my go-to person for a lot of things. Um, and she's really good with our kids. Um, and Mrs. 
Wendy Hacker. When Kim's not here, Kim's only with us half time. When I have a kid that needs help, I call Wendy and she helps. And I'm very appreciative of her willingness to work with our elementary kids as well. So, um, again, two really great teachers and, and great people to work with here in our district. Any questions? Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> our, uh, technology in the classroom, uh, <clears throat> there's some of the uh, teaching staff there working on their iPads. Uh, we've had some recent training uh, with that. Uh, we'll have some more in-depth training on uh, how we get that used in the classroom here coming up in uh, the middle of the month here. Um, we've got Lisa Cornwell is, is doing some of the implementation, finding apps and getting, uh, uh, getting teachers uh, up to speed with using those and checking the thing out, and that's uh, quite a job there. <coughs> um, so she's got a, a varied role with her nurse duties and uh, career development and uh, now iPads. And, uh, uh, up next on our professional development, again, the iPads. Uh, we've been doing some work with the core beliefs and uh, our vision. We had some pretty good conversations about that last time. Um, we're looking at having some classroom visits or some school visits, sending some teachers out to get some ideas from other schools about how they do MTSS, uh, iPads, how they use those, um, any ideas for the Common Core curriculum, how they develop their curriculum. Um, any of those things, uh, any other things that uh, teachers are excited about. Um, our teacher evaluation uh, process, we don't have to have anything developed. We have to let the state know by roughly March 1 um, whether we're going to use the state system or something else. Uh, we've decided as a group the state system isn't something we're comfortable with. Uh, it seems very uh, incomplete now, which it's in the pilot stages, so that inherently is not complete. Uh, so we just weren't comfortable going with that. Uh, so we've picked two uh, formats that we're going to look at. Uh, we'll meet later this month, um, and Barb and Carolyn will communicate with you about that. Um, uh, election filings, uh, we've got our two uh, uh, new folks, Carl Bear in uh, District 5 has filed. Uh, nobody else has filed to run against him. And Vince Fisher in District 6, and then Barb, uh, oh, nobody filed to run in that position, except Vance as well. And Barb is the only one that filed in District 4. So, uh, Good luck. barring any uh, crazy writing <laughs> campaigns, oh, yeah. we've, uh, we've got our uh, school board set. So I've sent information to these gentlemen and uh, invited them to meetings and sent them the budget document and our board goals. To, uh, so glad to see them here. Uh, on that note, with our districts, I do have some information about setting up districts. We talked last meeting about what could we do differently. Um, I think maybe Chad mentioned, could we look at uh, having one from each district and having four at large? I've since learned that's not a possibility. State statute spells out exactly what you can do. You can have two districts with three people and one at large, three districts with two people in each one, like we are, and one at large. You have six districts with one at large or all at large. Those are your only options. So, uh, and with some information on, on districts there. And again, we're going to discuss that later, but. We had that information that's uh, just recently come across my desk. So. Um, our legislative update. update um, it's on your, uh, if you just touch your iPad and go to documents, I believe provided you with a copy. You see legislative update on there? No. Okay, I will email this to you. Um, a few bills, I didn't include everything because there's lots of stuff happening now. Uh, two uh, 
a Senate concurrent resolution. It's not. It's this has to be Senate and House because it involves a constitutional change. Um, uh, well, first of all, I missed that. We have Friday webinars. KSB puts these on. I will try to send you the link before 12:30 on Friday. But every Friday at 12:30, you can go on and view that and listen to uh, what KSB has to report on that. Um, but the judicial selection, this would change from our, our current situation. Uh, three nominations come from a, a commission. Uh, there's attorneys part of that commission, and then the governor appoints somebody. What they're proposing is to change to a federal system, uh, which is the governor appoints and Senate confirms, just like uh, it, it works with our president and, the, and Senate now. Uh, that requires two-thirds vote in the House and the Senate, and then it goes to a public vote where a simple majority would make that constitutional change. KSB is opposed. Uh, this seems very targeted at the recent education legislation. Um, it is ironic that this system was put in place in the 50s, uh, went away from that federal system, because at the time the legislature was concerned about the governor having too much power. Uh, so now we're looking going back to that system. Um, the suitability part uh, has to do with Article 6 in the Constitution. That would change it. Uh, the Constitution says the legislature must provide suitable provision for finance of the educational interest of the state. That's how the recent uh, court case was ruled, is that the Constitution says we provide uh, sufficient funds for education. Uh, you're not doing that. So they want to change that to say legislature only has the power to do that. Um, so that again would be a constitutional change. Keep in mind, uh, I think it's important to remember that the Constitution is what the people say should happen. Uh, it keeps things not subject to the whims of a simple majority of the legislature. Uh, let's say if you think of the Second Amendment, I don't want, uh, uh, and a lot of people don't want, uh, Second Amendment rights taken away simply because 51% of the House and Senate think that's the way it should be. We've got it established in the Constitution. Uh, it requires a huge uh, effort to change that. So those things are going on. Are you gonna... To that point, doesn't doesn't uh, change require a state ref I mean, a referendum or that's the right term? Two-thirds two vote in the House, two-thirds vote in the Senate, and then a statewide public vote. Um, teachers unions, uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into all of this. Uh, there's some uh, bills to limit uh, rights of teachers unions for payroll deductions, for political action. Um, there's going to be a lot more things coming out uh, about that that uh, we don't have time to discuss all that. Uh, uh, things may get a little uh, touchy in school districts across the state pitting teachers unions against school boards. And, um, it, it could be very interesting. School board elections, there's no legislation that's been filed yet, but the discussion is to move school board elections to November, um, which would, in theory, save money. Uh, the struggle there is uh, districts would have to consolidate. Um, all of the um, city, county, um, all of those things, township, uh, school board boundaries, district boundaries, would not be decided by us, it would be decided by townships or county lines and those things. Uh, so really what that means is all school districts would have to be at large unless there's an easy way to consolidate those districts. Um, KSB is opposed because it seems to, it would dilute school issues in the, the April elections, local, uh, local politics take precedence. We're not too worried about national issues at those elections. Uh, property taxes, this is one I don't uh, really understand. Uh, on one hand, we talk about local control, um, but on the other hand, uh, this legislation tells local municipalities that uh, if the valuation in your district goes up, then your mill levy has to come down, and then you need to publish that we're going to raise the mill levy back to what it just was. Um, 
So I guess the idea there is transparency. If the valuation goes up, more money is coming into the budget. We need to be transparent that we're spending more money even though we're not raising the mill levy. Uh, I guess the issue there is that's kind of the intent of that. As property values rise, so are costs. So things are more expensive. So in a perfect world where costs never went up, uh, insurance costs didn't increase, energy costs didn't increase, uh, that might make sense. But uh, uh, the tax plan that the governor has proposed uh, is to, uh, to maintain the 6.3% sales tax, <clears throat> eliminate a deduction for mortgage interest. These things are needed because of the income tax cuts that recently uh, went into effect. Uh, if those things happen, which there's not a lot of support for, uh, a lot of legislators have said, we promised we would scale back the, tax, uh, the sales tax, we're going to stick with that promise. Um, that will leave an ending balance where they want it. Uh, their goal is 7.5%. A lot of times they don't achieve that goal. Without it, the, uh, uh, that additional revenue, the ending balance would be $30 million. So what does that mean? If those things don't go, uh, go into effect, the sales tax and the mortgage interest deduction elimination, uh, things will change. We don't have enough revenue to operate, so we'll need to find other ways to cut or find other revenue. I say we, I mean they. Uh, the governor is also proposing that income taxes eventually go to zero. All of that, if we do nothing, means there's an immediate problem. If they do part of that, the sales tax and the mortgage interest, then we've solved the immediate problem. If we do all of those things and income tax to zero, that's creating a longer range problem. Um, so for the governor's budget, he's projecting that base state aid will remain the same the rest of this year and then to next year and then raise uh, a little bit to 38.52. Special education aid will remain flat which, again, in a perfect world, if costs don't increase, nobody wants to see government spending increase. Uh, but when costs go up, things get more expensive. Uh, that's, that's what happens. So if special education aid stays flat, costs go up, that means, really, we're taking a cut. We're getting less per teacher. And uh, so that's the uh, legislative update. Any questions on that? One. Special education budget. Um, I didn't have that on here, but I'm serving on a committee to look at how we can get that budget in line. Um, you should have a document on your file there, has special ed info. I'll take a look at that one. Why this is important. Highlighted the uh, see the budget. Not a lot of, uh, means much there, but if you look at the unencumbered cash balance, you can see that dropped by a million and then by a million again. Uh, that can't continue, uh, especially when, as Merlin mentioned, uh, there's going to be three quarters of a million to a million dollars worth of insurance costs that need to be paid. <coughs> because of the new uh, Health Care Act. So, what does that mean? Well, it means more revenue or cutting expenses. 87% of their budget is personnel. Cutting expenses means cutting people. Uh, their revenue is provided by the state and us as districts. So, the state's not providing more money, so more revenue for them means more expense for us. So, those are really the two options. You can kind of see on the graphs there how the population, the overall student population has been dropping. Special ed population has actually been going up a little bit. And we've been hiring more teachers and more parents. And then this information, I'll, I'll let you, I'll send this to you in an email so you have it at home. This kind of compares districts. 
Now the danger here is you can't look at this and say, well, well gosh, we're, we're right in the middle on the, our ratio of paras to students. Well, that's this year. We may have a para that is with one student all day long, and somebody else may have three kids that are that way. Three kids that require one para for each kid. Uh, so it just depends on the needs of the kids at the time. So it's important to look at this, but this is one year in time. So you can't look at that and say, well, uh, Attica's uh, really being wasteful. Um, it could be that case, but just as an example, not picking on Attica. So we've got a challenge there. I think their challenge is the same challenge that school districts have had for the last uh, five, six years. <clears throat> the Center for Innovative School Leadership Review, I think you have some information on that, on your documents as well. I'm taking materials over to Bill Saylor's this week. Uh, Julianne's been gathering information, lots of people putting information together for that. They will be here on March 4th and March 5th to visit with people in the district. They'll be at our board meeting that night as well. Um, so here's kind of a schedule of the people they're going to visit with. We'll be in an executive session. Our board meeting's at 8 because of the PE program. So they'll be in an executive session with the board at 8 till 8.45. And then we'll come back to our regular meeting. We have to open the meeting at 8, go into executive session, and then we'll start uh, with the budget here. And we'll have to do that. And then we'll... Uh, I will keep the agenda as light as possible with the late evening. So I may be asking you for some input on other issues uh, during the next month. And as you can see, they'll be here most of the day. And then again on Tuesday, they'll be here interviewing people. Um, and then here's some information about what they're looking at. Uh, April, they will provide us with a rough draft. May, they'll be here to present. And then June, they'll finish up with the full report. So we ought to have some good information by April. Uh, facility Im improvements. Um, I was pretty gung-ho to try to get something done uh, uh, last meeting. I think it's important that we wait on uh, some of this information uh, from from these people. I've got an architect coming in next week and I'm still going to visit with him. Um, but, uh, but I do think it's important that we understand all of this information. That's why we did it in the first place. And to jump the gun, uh, I think we're not be prudent. Um, so other than that, on those things, I don't have much more to report uh, as of now. February 15th is a challenge. Um, and maybe it's not. I hope it's not. The issue is we have our Junior High Music Festival. That's on our master calendar as a day for students and teachers. So uh, a good superintendent would have asked questions a lot sooner, but I just learned about what our past practice was on that day recently. So the issue is um, the junior high and high school teachers work at the festival half of the day and then they don't work half of the day, or they work in their rooms doing uh, work if they have it. Elementary in the past, uh, they have kids half a day, and then they go home half a day. Um, does that sound familiar? Sort of. My, my question is, okay, I, I just wanted to make sure, since it's not on the master calendar, um, that the board is okay with that setup and how we run that. Um, I, I thought the elementary was in school the whole day, so we That's can still count it. Yeah, we can't count it for junior high and high school. Principals, you've been here. Tell me what we've done. Been in school the whole day. And, yeah. Junior, senior high works yeah. afternoon or morning, supervising, and they do other things in the afternoon. And elementary went to school all day till about 10 years ago, eight years ago. I don't remember when it was. Then it changed to, I can't remember exactly when. It's been a long time, 14 years. But it went to school all day for a while. And then 
at a certain point, they went to school till noon, ate lunch, and then the students went home. Oh. Yeah. This is for what? Yeah. For junior music festival. Yeah. We use so much of the building, you can't have class oh. with the junior high yeah. high school. We use so many rooms, it's just not, not possible. <clears throat> and we can't count that as an instructional day unless everybody's required to be here. So it's not going to be counted as mm -hmm. an instructional day for junior high and high school anyway, unless we cancel the festival, which isn't a good option. <laughs> so the issue is whether or not you keep the elementary school or not. Is that what the issue is? No, that we do what the plan was. Are, are we okay with the past practice of the, the teachers working half a day and going home for half a day? And, and there's a Sorry, I had to there. look it up and yeah. I asked some other teachers because I couldn't yeah. remember either. I was the same way. Okay. The years all kind of blend together. And I couldn't remember if we'd negotiated it or not. And mm -hmm. what we found on page 10 of our negotiated agreement was this. When school is dismissed at one level and teachers at that level have no duty day, it should be dismissed at all levels. Right. And that's, I think that's what applied to this situation. We didn't want to say specifically the Junior High Music Festival Day. Right. That was the only thing. Mm -hmm. So my question is, are we okay with past practice? I would recommend we put this on the calendar if we're going to continue to host this. And spell that out in the negotiated or out of, in the master calendar of what we're doing that day. Uh, it it's not on. No, it doesn't show us elementary half a day. Know. And, yeah. I obviously right. don't either. Yeah. <laughs> we'll wait for this year. Right. No, I think it's fine. Same mm -hmm. I didn't realize they had changed right. it. It's been a while since Tacey's been down there. I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> now that I think about okay. it. Okay. I just wanted to, I didn't feel comfortable since we're talking uh, master calendar and contractual days. Then. Okay, well we will make sure we communicate that better on our calendar for next year. Um, that's all I have. All right. Um, I guess we're ready to move to executive session. And how much time will we need for um, let's say 15 minutes. Okay. Give me a break. And we're going to a motion to go to the session with uh, personnel or personnel and negotiations with administrators and government. Um, we don't. We don't do no. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. President, I move the board uh, going to a session for a period of 15 minutes to discuss confidential personnel matters. And negotiation. Second motion. Move and is going to executive session for 15 minutes to discuss personnel negotiations with the uh, superintendent. <coughs> All in favor, right hand. Opposed, same sign, 6 0. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing. Great. Uh, we're back in regular session. Uh, we have items to bring forth here. Uh, yeah, I would uh, ask for a motion to accept the resignation of Marla Irvin as uh, junior high and high school cheerleader sponsor mm -hmm. at the end of this year. Ms. President, I move that we accept Marla's resignation as junior high and high school cheerleading sponsor the end of this year. Second. Move and second to approve the resignation, to accept the resignation letter from Marla Irvin for junior high and high school church sponsor at the conclusion of the school term. Any discussion? All in favor, right hand. 6 so. Request a motion to uh, uh, roll the uh, both principal's contracts forward uh, two years, so that would be uh, giving them a two-year contract for the next two school years. You guys I'll make that motion. Second. Yes. Second yes. to approve the uh, administrative contracts for 
elementary and high school principals for two year contracts. Any discussion? All in favor, right hand. 6 0. I'd entertain a motion to approve the uh, two, -year, uh, two year contract for the superintendent as well. Mr. President, I'll move that uh, we approve a two year contract for Mr. Meyer. So second. Thank you. Move and second to approve a two year contract for Mr. Meyer, the superintendent. Is there any discussion? On the favor, right now. If so. Thank you. Negotiations team? Yeah. You got them picked out? Mm hmm. This president, I'll make our own advancement for negotiations. That make you feel good in the back row. Fresh prey, Tara. Fresh right. prey. You have experience, don't you? Uh, <laughs> well, this could be a good thing for you to lead yeah. on. Serve on that? Yeah. Okay. He's done it. Stands with this. And Chad? Bill? Bill? It's one of your two, right? Yeah. Okay. Chad and Stan? Okay, so we have volunteers to serve on today. Thank you very much. I'm assuming that Tom will be an alternate, glad alternate. <laughs> Since he's not here. <laughs> and uh, so forth. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other items to come for us? Oh, um, I know something. Did you have to check in on a video or um, cameras? No, I haven't hallway? done that yet. No. I didn't know if that was on that facility. Thing. No, and that's something we can do in that and the playground and the restrooms are the things that um, I think without waiting on the efficiency review information that we do. Is there any way that, or should we begin with the playground is an issue that we really want to address along with the uh, uh, committee that meets? Is there a way that we can just let the, the community know that, that we want to do that? Because there's a lot of people in the community that come by and utilize that. Mm -hmm. And maybe there could be some donations given to help speed that up a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah, that type of thing might mean that there's the trade-off. You always mm -hmm. wait a long time for grant cycles and announcements and all that. I just think that, that the type there of may thing be a, you know, it's like we did with teachers, but this is more for young people and I think it's, it's we just let them know it's a need that we're addressing and maybe we could speed the process up a little bit. You know, grants, mm -hmm. sure. as far as children's health, and wellness grants love it working with playgrounds and things mm -hmm. and maybe that is something that maybe Lisa could mm -hmm. even look into. Well, I'm wondering if to speed up the process yeah. of the, of what, whether we need to just bring in sod, lay sod down and uh, over the grass areas, you know, till it up, lay sod and uh, speed that up. I know somebody at lay sod I could see I if they could come up here. Right. Maybe they have uh, uh, maybe some second grade stuff. That yeah, something that's fallen off the track along the way. <laughs> but really, if that's something we're going to address right away, I think it's a key area. Are they wanting everything's put in song? No, one, the issue is they want nice grass. They want the kids to not have to play in stickers. Okay, so are they talking about the having water. an underground system well, put in place? Or? Yeah, I think yeah, ideally. That for you. If you're going to do yeah. sod, you need an underground yeah. system. Mm -hmm. right. Well, I can have uh, Tony come up here and at least give a bit, and then we kind of know a starting point. Well, we kind of need to know what we're going to do the whole time. You know, if it's going to be a sprinkler system with grass in it, and if there's any more um, soft layers that we need to put anywhere, like under some equipment, um, repairs to any of that, kind of know what all that needs to be. Yeah. And it needs to fit with any uh, other construction that right. may happen. Right. You don't want to spend a lot of money in one right. area to Internal. prohibit other construction. Mm -hmm. right. Anyway, well, I think if the community did it, there are areas that we're going to address. 
guys sure. were talking about them, but yeah. Connor may read the board minutes. Do you want to find out what areas they're talking about? And then yeah, I, I need to get their recommendations. Out. I mean, they've been looking at it for several months and what they want. Um, so, okay. It's going to be probably more money than we have to spend for this summer. Do you have a general, very general, broad idea of the scope of investment? No. Sorry. I mean, like the bleachers, what we asked for is donations, and we, yeah. the school matched it. So if we had yeah. something, sure. we could work out that way and yeah. let the public know. All right. If there's nothing else, I have entertain a motion for adjournment. Mr. President, I move to adjourn. Second. Move to adjourn. All in favor, please. please.